Hello, welcome to Deprogrammed. I'm Rollo Pinel, and I'm here again with Poppy and Harrison. Now, Poppy, you wanted to talk about um, the way they're prosecuting gang members. Something's changing. What's going on? Yeah, so um, this week I was reading The Guardian, shock horror, and I do actually read The Guardian newspaper, and uh, they had a really interesting piece about something called joint enterprise convictions. Now, it sounds pretty innocuous, but what joint enterprise basically means is it's a <clears throat> law that involves the prosecution of people who are involved in, say, gang violence, or say, if there's some kind of coordinated attack on someone, if you were to, say, help collaborate in that killing, you can then be prosecuted through this joint enterprise law. So it's a really old law. It's existed for hundreds of years, but the way that we've using it in like the modern policing sense is specifically to go after gang members, right? Why is it necessary as opposed to just like murder or theft well, the, or whatever? The problem is with a lot of gang killings, you know, it's not that every single person in the gang will be, you know, physically involved in like an attack on someone, right? But that doesn't mean that you're not culpable. Like, a like if you're, if you're say, say you're a getaway driver, you know, someone's just gone and stab someone and you're driving the car to help get them to a safe house well okay you may not have murdered someone but you're still culpable because you know exactly what's going on you've been involved in the planning and you've helped facilitate the exit from the crime scene that's the sort of thing that joint enterprise is there to uh, you know step in and say well that person can't walk away free because although they haven't actually done the murder they are still clearly guilty so literally guilty by association right guilty about. by association right you know it sounds kind of uh, slightly dodgy on paper, but from the examples I've kind of given, you can understand why it's necessary. Mm -hmm. If you are going after gang crime, which is obviously you know a real blight on you know the lives of young people and anyone who's living in like a city or an urban area, it's important. But of course, <coughs> in this country at the moment, particularly on the left, people are more in, less interested in justice than they are in playing identity politics. And so, uh, I've got some statistics here which people on the the, the left have been ob objecting to in quite strong terms in that Guardian piece, mm. which which Poppy mentions, which I've also read because I also read the Guardian. Funnily mm. enough, okay. um, it says that um, w w with respect to these joint enterprise convictions, thirty eight point five percent of them in twenty fourteen were used to go after um, white people, uh, but 54.7% of them were, were, were used to go after BAME people. Right. And so people on the left are pointing to the existence of a racial disparity right. there, and you know, that not satisfied to say, well, maybe certain communities might be overrepresented in gang violence, they don't want to go there. Um, they, they pivot to, well, the system itself must be unjust in some way yeah, if it's going after these people disproportionately. And this really goes back to the High Court case, right, which is um, really what the article was centred around. It's this controversy that Harrison's kind of mentioned. So the reason why campaign groups and one of the – it was kind of led by two. One is Liberty, which is quite a famous charity, and one is called Jengba. Um, they both took this case to court because they said – the CPS, which is the Crown Prosecution Service, needs to start recording ethnicity data on who is being convicted under this joint enterprise law. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're going to point to the sort of statistics that Harrison's just shown mm. there, and they're going to go, well, look, you know, certain ethnic minority groups are overrepresented. Uh, go, this is in breach of the Equality Act, and then, you know, subsequently, the law is racist, and we need to get rid of the law. You know, mm. yeah. This is how mm. these charities kind of operate. They'll identify some kind of disparity, and they'll go, well, that that's, can't be right, that's nasty, it doesn't seem nice. So we need to get rid of the law and scrap it all together. But that's nuts, because these laws are essential. Because well, the yeah. whole thing about uh, gang violence and gang operations is, they all operate with ignorance and they've all got hmm. kind of small parts to play and you need to be able to nail them all together. Well, yeah, I mean, it's also putting the lives of, you know, young people at risk. I mean, one really high profile example, uh, I mean, this provoked the Labour MP Lucy Powell to write in to complain about the joint enterprise law. This is the case of the murder of a boy called John Soyobi, who was 16 years old and was killed in Manchester as part of gang related violence. You know, he was cut down, I think he was stabbed 15 times by boys with machetes, Jesus, yeah. you know, uh, it, this is such a violent, barbaric crime. It's just devastating for his family, his friends, you know, and, and he was killed by boys of the same, you know, background as him. He's a, he's a black um, child and a lot of these other boys were teenage, same sort of age group who were also involved in the killing. And you then see kind of politicians getting involved and saying, well, you know, this law is racist because the perpetrators were blacked and were fined and, you know, were then prosecuted. 
but it's like I mean they were killing people within their own community so even when we're talking about something like uh, a boy being stabbed to death right these left-wing MPs and the mm. like mm. still don't they, they're, they're willing to kind of create a kind of racist narrative well it's political yeah of course it's politicized it's to push they're, they're, an agenda they're more interested in their sort of race obsessed ideological paradigm than they are in actually doing what's right for individuals living mm. in a community wanting to stay safe within a community and it's absurd as well because there's no reason why what well, there's every reason why joint enterprise convictions should also go after white gangs if, if and when they exist so if you had a sort of let's say hypothetically you had a sort of a white supremacist gang that went after you know r r randomly went after a, a black boy near the bus stop for example and killed him with a machete or with, or with whatever um, whatever weapon it might be joint enterprise convictions could be used to convict every single white boy within that it's gang just, as well. It's also just reflecting reality, like convictions reflect reality. Mm. Um, you, you know, men are massively overrepresented in sexual yes. assault statistics because yes. they're committing more of the crime. Mm. I mean, the, the, all of this kind of activist uh, kind of push to get rid of you know, laws that protect people's safety will actually end up doing is putting more innocent lives at risk. And they don't care about this, you know. I mean, one of these um, kind of small activist groups that's on the periphery is um, run by a lady called Roxy Mulgain, and it's called Kids of Colour. I mean, this woman, I'm, she uh, speaks about the, the people who were involved in the violent attack on a 16-year-old boy, and she speaks about them like they're just, you know, sweet, friendly little neighbourhood boys who haven't done anything wrong. You know, she describes some of the um, convicted killers as being beautiful. It's, it's mm. completely inappropriate, and it's driven by this um, heavily racialized narrative um, that, you know, I if you are white, you are culpable, and if you are not white, you are not. Um, that the justice system is institutionally racist towards, uh, you know, black communities, and this is just not reflected in reality at all. You know, it, it's it's basically trying to pursue a model in which um, people, the, the victims don't matter, but the perpetrators do. You know, yeah. it's, it's complete anarcho tyranny, and it's something that we should really, really strongly push back against when we see it. Because well, it's so often the case that if you are if there's a kind of crime that's being reported on the news mm. and if you have ever had a kind of personal if you've known that person back in the day or whatever i think everyone who's been in that situation will recognize that the way they're reported on the news is completely different to how you actually rem remember that person in real right. life it's so easy to paint a narrative and mm -hmm. to paint who was actually probably a you know a thuggish gang member as a, just a sweet person mm -hmm. or you know in many different situations they're, they're painted in a completely skewed way mm -hmm. and so they're using that to basically just um to just kind of create a, a narrative where they can push their ideology yeah. mm -hmm. in, in it's and it, it's completely um yeah it's uh, uh you would have thought that there was a line yeah but there's not a line but there's, there, 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 there's nothing more threatening to justice uh in a culture in which sort of ideological, like rigid ideological templates reign, and sort of the, the details of individual responsibility and moral conduct, moral conduct and moral character become optional, and this is sort of what happens and uh, un un under under the current uh, regime, um, I think as well that you know there's a lot of talk about critical race theory um, uh, and the, the, the way in which this might be dictating mm. a lot of this stuff. I, I do think that there is some merit to that argument that uh, because critical race theory. You know, proceeds from th the basic assumption that our, 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 our societies are institutionally and systemically racist, that Western societies are institutionally and systemically racist. It's the idea that racism is so woven into our mm. cultural DNA, the only way we can effectively extirpate it is by, um, you know, su subjecting all of our institutions to a sort of curative authoritarian regime of legally enforced racial equity. And so um, once you've um, redefined racism, in those terms and racism ceases to be about what I might do to this person oh. or what that person might do to me when it becomes sort of systemic and institutional it means that you can condemn any institution you can condemn any law in this joint enterprise convictions oh. you condemn con you can condemn any practice if it can be if it can, if it's is stand if it um if it stands accused of being complicit in oppression by producing right. unequal outcomes between different groups and right. so all of a sudden ev everything can be thrown on the bonfire this is why one of critical race theory's pop clerics. He's not. He's not one of the high priests. He's, he's not at Harvard. Law, he's, <laughs> he's not. He's not at Harvard Law School. But Ibram X. Kendi, the American. Oh yeah. Uh, the American. The midwits intellectual. The, the midwits intellectual. Not so. P people talk about that's not real critical race theory. All this sort of. This yeah, is sort of yeah. These are the sort of debates that have been going on in the U.S. over the last two years. And it's true that 
Ibram X. Kendi isn't technically a critical race theorist. He, he's, he's not like Derek Bell or Gene Stefanczyk mm. or um, Richard Delgado. These are sort of high priest critical race theorists working within institutions. He's a more of a sort of a pop cleric. Mm. But he's nevertheless said that crit critical race theory is foundational to his work. And one of his, one of his propositions for the United States is um, he wants the United States to adopt a fourth branch of government. Um, so since the, United, the US Constitution was set up and was drafted in 1787, they've had three branches of government. They've had con the Congress, they've had the presidency, and they've had the judiciary. He wants to set up a federal department of anti-racism, yeah, well. which would have supreme power over all American laws and would have the power to veto any American law or any American practice, even if it's, you know, as, as in whether it's in Wyoming or Alabama, that this federal department of anti-racism would have supreme power to yeah. veto that if they can prove in any way that it would lead to disparate outcomes. Of course, between but this, racial groups. you know, this is an American example. Yeah. But like, I really can't stress enough because I think people kind of, you know, reflect culpability away from Britain and go like, yeah, well, you know, we were totally fine before this weird American True. cultural stuff True. came here. It's like, no, we are completely on board with this ideology. We mm. have it on our books. Mm -hmm. The 2010 Equality mm -hmm. Act literally mandates that you're allowed to do these mm -hmm. kind of activist yeah, pushes absolutely. to change the law. You know, this is something we've had 13 years now of conservative mm -hmm. government, and they're not standing up the Crown Prosecution Service at a time where it's you know it's really quite scary to like walk through the streets of you know any major city in Britain mm. today like god I feel terrified I, I've unfortunately had two incidents in the last two months where I've had um, people who are obviously incredibly mentally disturbed um, attack me on public transport mm. you know and it's it's one of those situations where you feel that like when you do see people convicted they have like you know it's a tiny slap on the wrist We're constantly defending you know um, perpetrators of crimes nobody really cares about victims anymore and you're just kind of expected to just get you know put up with it you've just got to put up with the fact that you know your police service is underfunded um, that when you do go with a legitimate complaint they're going to brush it off and then they're constantly talking about putting new laws on the books for like catcalling or yeah, something. Yeah. You know, it re I really can't like stress enough just how lawless Britain feels today. And I, I do think the people that are pushing for these sorts of legislative changes, they're bad people. You know, they're, they're really they, these are real. So wives. these people, they're they're MPs and they're charities. Yeah, it's like MPs. So like Lucy Powell is one of the people that spoke out against it. Diane Abbott. Um, so like lots of Labour MPs. Although from what I can tell, Conservative MPs don't really know or care about joint enterprise convictions really? um, and in the case of the charitable groups I mean the major one is Liberty which is a kind of human rights charity which obviously sounds very nice and friendly but unfortunately in their push for um, a rolled back state well guess what we already functionally have a rolled back state so um, like the last thing we need is less enforcement of our laws so they're one of the groups involved with it and uh, Jengba which is an association of uh, families of these convicted uh, you know people who've been convicted on joint enterprise who are obviously saying that like oh well my family member hasn't done anything wrong obviously not representing the, the you know victims of people who've actually been stabbed to death in the street by gang members you know it's it's a coalition of people who refuse to accept that some people are just bad well there's a parallel there because and I'm going to use schools as an example mm. so if I got in trouble at school and um, the school called in my mother to kind of have a chat yeah. about my behavior or whatever. Um, there is absolutely no question that my mother would have been completely on the school side. Yeah. Oh, same right. here, mm. same here. And that would have been normal, right? The parent, the, the, you know, the parents would have listened to the teachers, mm -hmm. took their side, right, you behave badly. But I think now that's changing and you're getting a lot more of parents saying, no, well, my son or daughter could never do anything. Well, yeah. right. yes. And then you kind of get that reflected in the yes. in the thing. And then also, I mean, so going back to this charities thing, it's is this, this is a sense where basically every charity you ever hear of is just pushing incessant left wing mm. ideology and dogma. Mm. I know it's it's you know it's it's a real area of interest for me particularly because I think I mean you don't want to be the person that's going after the charity sector because it makes you sound like a horrible exactly, Scrooge yeah. McDuck yes. character. But the thing I always try and get across to people is that like. You know, your contemporary British charity isn't helping donkeys. Um, it's trying to overturn gang law. You know, these are yeah. people in the charity sector um, are often incredibly left-wing, very ideologically radical, are willing to go into sectors where they're not necessarily going to get much money, um, and you know, are essentially 
cultural revolutionaries and that you know they should not just be given a complete free reign to push for their political pet causes with yeah. public money there was a great line and you wrote an article earlier this month about the charity sector and there was a great line where you talked about how the 2011 charities act mm. had essentially made left-wing policies um what was the line I, I i described it as if i recall um you know, my human rights campaign, your cultural battle, as the difference between left and right. Because basically, if you are a right-wing group, you will be, uh, you know, correctly identified as a lobbyist group, so you won't get like the charitable benefits that something like the Running Me Trust will. They can say, well, I'm not political. I'm just sticking up for the rights of marginalised certain groups. Mm. And that's because they they identified one of the causes of the Equalities Act as right. as um, inclusivity or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, under the 2011 Charities Act, it's literally written into the law. If your charitable organisation is political, but via the the stream of I'm, you know standing up for the rights of an ethnic group or a sexual minority well then you're suddenly not political and you can get charitable status you know this is also something 2011 something was made under a conservative government so, that's it. And so then it means we've enshrined that left-wing ideology into, into law. law yeah mm. into law and you know i think everyone gets pretty depressed reading the news i certainly do but you know, whenever I see people kind of going like, I don't know how we're supposed to deal with this woke nonsense. So, okay, but it's not nonsense. It's actually totally rational. Mm. You know, we've built our entire legal system mm. around this, um, and until we undo those laws, we're going to keep seeing the same crazy stories again and again. It's scary. Yeah. Scary stuff. Yeah, I think I think conservatives need to fight uh, a, a protracted war against this ideology being entrenched in our institutions at, at, at every level. We need to we because. I, I generally, don't, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, the silent majority and uh, actually being very opposed to this stuff. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter when it's being incubated within the bosom of the state. And I think that what conservatives need to do is we need to fight against that. And we need to make these people as irrelevant as sort of wicker worshipping pagans and other, <laughs> and, and, other and, and other oddballs because I generally don't think they, they, they would have that much purchase over the public no. mind if they hadn't infiltrated into the, our institutions okay. in the, no in one the way that they have. No one cares They're just them. clever at like, yeah. you know, getting public money. Like, yeah. you know, they pay attention to the law. I think there's a lot that conservatives can learn mm. from this. You know? They know how to take over institutions. You know? yes. It's much easier. It should be easier for us. We don't have to like trick people. You no. know, we're, we're just kind of repeating things that are like common sense <laughs> maxims. Like, yeah, you shouldn't let murderers go free. That's a bad Yes. And all these cra all these crazy left wing activists and charities kind of points to a very kind of left wing mindset because um, it's a left wing mindset to try and get money from the state. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, that, and they That's seem true. to be experts at yeah. getting money from the state. Yeah. Maybe we need to get better at rent well, seeking like that. I, mean? I think this is one of the unfortunate legacies of Thatcherism in many ways is that it, it, it has forced m many on the right to associate any sort of involvement with the state as being somehow illicit. Whereas in fact, you know, you know, the conservatives may have teamed up with liberalism and the idea of a small mm. state in order to win the Cold War, but we're in new times now, and we need to be more creative, I think. And we 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 can't let a sort of rigid libertarian commitment to shrinking the size of the state and not getting involved in the mm. state and to sort of reifying the public, the private sphere. We can't let that get in the way of being effective institutionally. Right, for sure. Mm. Now, Harrison, you sent me a video yes. this week, and you wanted to talk about that. Yes. Um, let, let's, let's have a look at that now. What are straight white men good for? Straight white men? Yeah. Not a lot. What are straight white men good for? Ooh, that's a hard one. I don't know. <laughs> uh... Do you think straight white men are important? Oh. Do you think straight white men are important? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're utter fucking trash. What are straight white men good for? Uh, being rude and um, making you feel uncomfortable. Jesus. Right, what are your thoughts on that? Right, okay, so one can have so many thoughts on that. It's, <laughs> it's, quite, <Maybe. laughs> it's quite amusing in many ways. I, I, Obviously, you know, the typical response would be to look at it and say, oh, look how horrible, look at how horrible this is, this sort of, the, ra the racial animus directed against white men is just appalling, and it is appalling, and maybe we'll get to that. But the thing I find most interesting about that is that it's one thing to harbour racist sentiments in your heart. It's one thing to, to, to sort of entertain those impulses that we're seeing displayed there in private. 
it's another thing altogether to have a camera put in your face and to be asked this question and yet still to be very, you know, yeah. sh you know uh, forthcoming in the fact that, it, it, w w with your prejudices in that way, I, it, I think what it goes to show is, is that, um, and the, the way that they're smiling, at, the way that they're laughing about it, the way that they're smiling about it, they know that this um, sort of anti-white racial bigotry is, you know, a designator of sort of social status, mm -hmm. an elite intellectual they status. They weren't kids, they were adults. Kids. They were adults as well. Elite status and moral enlightenment, because they have this idea that, well, Given that we live in, uh, is it, you know, a, a white-dominated, oppressive system, surely what could be more intellectually heroic than going on camera and, you know, de de declaring your bigotry against um, uh, straight white men? That's a very radical thing to do. Uh, it's just the, the, the thing I find funny about that is that there could hardly be anything less radical in, like, right. in, the, the, in, in the current climate. It's the last climate. safe bigotry, right? Yeah, I mean, literally, true. the state is on your side. Well, exactly. like, everyone I, agrees. I was about to say. So, yeah. just to give an example of how. This ideology isn't sort of fringe and edgy, but rather enthroned uh -huh. <laughs> at the moment. You know, the, the, the Ministry of Defence at the moment has explicit, under a Conservative government of 13 years standing, has explicit targets to get the, to get the number of women in the force from 12% to 30% uh, by the end of 2030. The RAF under Sir Mike Wigston has been even more ambitious. Uh, they want to get that number to 40% of men, uh, to 40% of women while doubling the number of ethnic minorities in the RAF within the same period. And a recent report um, found that the RAF had effectively been discriminating against straight white men in their hiring procedures precisely because they've been pursuing these sort of rigid, um, mm. uh, ideologically and uh, ideolog these ideologically rigid uh, diversity targets. And so, you know, th th this, th this mentality isn't edgy. It's, it's, not, um, sub it's not subversive. It's very destructive, I think, but it's not subversive. It's, it is, in fact, enthroned and established and orthodox. And you, you've, you've got the state on your side, as Poppy, as Poppy says. Mm. Yeah, the thing about uh, it happening in the military makes me think of, you know, they wouldn't, you know, surely they care about military prowess, right? They can't mm. not care about that. So yeah. the fact that they are, and the traditional effective soldier is a kind of burly, big, tough guy, right? Which mm. would kind of fall into that category. But clearly, it kind of shows how much warfare and attitudes to warfare have changed, that they don't think they mm. need big, strong soldiers, because it's obviously, you know, we're hurtling into the future, yes. and so that kind of stuff doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's sort of, it's the decadence brought about by peace, because obviously if, if Britain had been, in, you know, as Britain was often in, well, for most of its history, but so let's say, for example, in the 18th century, when Britain was fighting wars pretty routinely, usually with France, you know, you, you can't afford to let ideology mm. get, in, get in the way of, Beating those Frenchies in in in, 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 in the eighteenth century, it, it, w it was crucial. Otherwise, you wouldn't. We weren't going to win the War of Spanish Succession. You weren't going to win yeah. the Seven Years' War um, if we, if, you, if you're letting ideology get in the way, and if you're letting a, a very rigid, as I say, a very rigid ideological commitment to certain arbitrary diversity targets get in the way of quality. Because it, 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 the, the, obviously, every sort of, it goes without saying that every every woman and every ethnic minority who signs up to join the British Armed Forces is doing a lot more than I'm doing. And so obviously I, that, that needs to be respected a great deal. But when you've got the people in charge of the admissions process actively pursuing these minorities by definition, mm. what is a minority? A minority is a small group. That means you're narrowing the talent pool. And we want that talent pool well, to be as broad as possible. It's, it's also just, I mean, if, to carry on with that kind of like military perspective, mm. I mean, even the, the very idea of, I mean, this is why I find the whole like, you know, discussion over like, do you value the lives of these various identity or whatever? Like mm. that in itself is like a very modern idea. I mean, the, the idea of like treating the life of say like a soldier as like an individual entity with a, that held meaning is like really quite modern. Oh, really? Um, I mean, look at the example, example of um, the state dealing with the Boer War. Um, most of the soldiers in that you know circumstance, the only reason the state really started to care about this is because uh, all of the men they conscripted for this war were like so unfit and like unwell because you know they had grown up in like quite poor households and just felt like malnourished, had like birth deformities, like nobody was thinking of not, not well suited to the climate. But, like, you know, you you were just you were being churned out in yeah. a kind of killing machine, sure. you know, which is just the way that I think a lot mm. of warfare is. This mm. it's a very modern idea to try and find value. And they're saying like you you need to recognise my life as having value. Mm -hmm. It's like no, prove that you have value. That's it. You know who cares what some like blue haired woman in the street mm -hmm. says about you? Like mm -hmm. you should know intrinsically that you have value. Um, where it becomes distressing is when again, as you said, the state decides to get involved 
and deliberately by levelling the playing field mm. holds people back from fulfilling their true potential. Yes. Um, which is ultimately what this is. Yes. I mean, people then giggling on the sidelines, yes. but th they're doing it precisely because it is safe. Of course, know? of course. It makes sense with the military because you have the sense that all warfare now is just drones and missiles, so That's it true. doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense with the police though, because you said they're doing it with the police. And you have this sense that, you know, we spoke about gang crime and everyone knows that London, you know, gang crime is, you know, is on the up and up. And so you need kind of big, tough police, you know, people to to be able yeah. to kind of control these yes. guys. Can you and imagine me with a battle? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to hurt. I, like and so I just actually can't imagine you with one. <laughs> so it, doesn't make, yeah. it doesn't make strategic <laughs> sense. You know, no, it, doesn't no, you're right. it doesn't make any sense. That's the, that's really? the, that's the one of the main things yes. about it. You can kind of argue if the, if the military stuff is all drones and all mm. that kind of future yeah. stuff, who cares? But mm. actually, the police still need to be there on the ground mm. to subdue some, you know, a domestic situation yeah. or a gang situation yes, 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 or whatever. Yes. That where you know, in those situations, mm. brawn counts. Okay, absolutely, but they're going completely contrary to that with a with a. Com com completely, and th this this is the cause they will say, well, why can't we have an effective police force which is di which is diverse as well M maybe but but you should and that, that's a tedious comment for them to, to make of course but but I, the, the thing I would say to that in answer to that if, if people do say that is that okay but what are you ranking first like what is your main priority mm. here and if you're setting you know if, if you're wheeling out these sort of ostentatious targets to get the number of women to 30 percent or 40 percent to get the number of to double the number of ethnic minorities despite the fact that BAME people it says it mm. I think I think already in the military so I, th I think, if I remembering, um, if I can recall it from memory, I think that at the moment within the RAF, uh, it's already you've already got a, a figure of about twelve percent of the RAF being made up of people from minority ethnic backgrounds, which is roughly, I think, well, a, a, about really about what the proportion of minority ethnic people in the country is anyway. Reflects, but they want yeah. to get that to eighteen percent so within the next ten years. So they don't even want they don't only want to. Um, Keep it proportional. They want to sort of, you know, mm. make it deeply disproportional. Only in the in the other direction. If you're ranking those sorts of priorities first, then quality and doing the job and and, and pr protecting the protecting defending the realm and protecting local communities mm -hmm. is necessarily coming second, if best. And it should always be coming first. Right. So they're doing this in the military. They're doing this in the police. Mm. They're doing this in the schools. Are they doing this anywhere else? <laughs> Fire service as well. Oh, it's, yes. um yeah. I think it was like maybe under a Labour government they did this. They changed the requirements for um, obviously if you're like in the fire service, you're lifting a lot of bodies, you know, out burning buildings. Yeah. And they changed the weight requirement um, and how long you would have to carry it for to be more inclusive to women. Which um, you know, I don't know if we have any data on this, but I assume it's probably endangered quite a few lives <laughs> um, when your house yeah. is burning and you turn up at the door and it's a five foot yeah. two woman <laughs> who's going to be carrying you out of yeah. There's nothing burning more building. stereotypical than a six five firefighter. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but some <laughs> some jobs and some roles in society should not be inclusive ever, and that's yeah. fine. Like, I mean, this was something that was parodied in Friends back in the '90s, right? Would you feel comfortable with a male babysitter? Mm. I wouldn't. I would not mm. want a man to look after my yeah. children, and I would not want a woman to be like piloting a plane or something. You know, it's <laughs> I, look. I you should really see my directional. My spatial awareness is incredibly poor, yeah. and I'm stereotyping for half yes. of all women. I would be afraid. Well, I think I think I saw recently. I think Tucker Carlson had. Like, I, I like watching Tucker Carlson's daily tirades or lectures, depending on what, what yeah. which view you take on his quality. But um, I, I, he, he recently in the US, I think they've been lowering the standards that female pilots have to pass in order to in, in order to get a license, which which, yeah. which 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 is again another example of basics to do with safety and mm. security. But again, be, with being pilots. In, being endangered. In, in, in the name of rigid ideological tactics. I'd say with pilots, they're doing it in the military because they're doing it because it doesn't matter anymore. I mean, pilots don't really fly planes anymore. They press buttons press and buttons. it's autopilot. The military, the soldiers yeah. don't fight. Yeah. They don't yeah. need to be able to fight. We're past that. And so because they know that we're past that, yeah, they can true. get away with it. Um, but you're right. There are just some. I mean, I remember watching that Louis Through documentary years ago, where he went into that Miami Mega Max prison. Yes, and yeah, I've seen that. There were female um, prison oh, guards, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about how you know the kind of situations they had to put up with with mm. the male inmates. Yeah. Mm. And your immediate response is, you what know, are you doing? Why the hell are they in that? Right, exactly. I mean, 
This is unfortunately what happens when you have affirmative action um, kind of introduced into your legal system. Um, I mean, you, you're right about like it doesn't matter, but it's not just that it kind of doesn't matter. It obviously does in certain cases. It's that we don't record the data. Mm. You know, um, with something like affirmative action on medical school um, applications, which is something that goes on a lot in America at the moment, the uh, threshold for what grade you need to get in your SAT, which is the testing they use, yeah. depends on what racial group you're yeah. in. Yeah. Um, no now, way. I don't know about you, but if I was going through a heart surgery, yeah. I mean, this is this is what unfortunately will happen yeah. is if you're sensible, you would discriminate because you're like, well, I don't know if my doctor is and you know just as good as anyone else. They're or they got there, yeah, or they got yeah. there through affirmative action. They do it for the LSAT as well for legal courses. I mean, it's more you know worrying if it's your doctor than yeah. your lawyer. But either way, you know, this is the sort of thing that we should be really concerned that when Absolutely. it does start to come to Britain, because yeah, in a lot of circumstances it doesn't matter, but like when the data is suppressed by the government because they don't want to, you know, cause people to freak out. Your rational action is actually to be discriminatory. Like rationally, that's the best thing you could possibly do. So it's massively backfiring, yeah. you know, because then once you're aware that this affirmative action is going on, the best thing to do is to go, well, okay, now hang on, what is the threshold for this? And if I yes. do have a, a a woman firefighter, then I'm going to be concerned because I know it, she's not going to. Yeah, this if, is this is not good for society. Yes, if, if institutions are holding minorities and women to lower standards, then you're, mm. as a you're going to get a backlash in which ordinary people, aware of the fact that there's this sort of tinkering going on, are going to hold them to higher mm -hmm. standards, which which is only going to sort of fuel the, the, the vicious cycle of racial resentment and discri discrimination in, bo in both mm -hmm. directions. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a healthy thing for it. Uh, it's, it's not a healthy bit of software for societies to, no. to, to be running on. Yeah, well, because this is the thing. When I watched that video, I basically thought, not, I thought, you know, who cares? To be honest, mm. they're putting across these points of view they seem crazy, but I'd actually take more notice if the people in that video didn't seem to just be the cast or extras from the set of Escape from New York. I mean, these people, <laughs> these people, you know, they're all kind of a bit freakish and they yeah. don't seem like normal people. And so, but actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it goes much further than that. This mm. is going right the way to the top of government. Well, yeah, I know. Is that, that's, this is like the bang, uh, the, the drum I keep on banging. It's like, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's diffused amongst like random people in the populace, but yeah. like the government believe this. The yes. government are totally on board with this. This is a top down ideology. Like by the time you've got random freaks in the street laughing along yeah. at it, it's too late. Exactly. Like it's already exactly. culturally exactly. diffused. Yes. You yes. know, if you had done this 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you would have got very different answers. That but like now, the rot has yeah, already seeped the, in. All, the, all, yeah, all they're doing is echoing the, the, the ruling ideology while enjoying the idea of themselves as sort of rebels outside, oh, yeah, out, outside yeah, the yeah. city walls. But they're, they're square. I mean, the, 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 the mentality they represent is squarely within the city walls at this point. It, mm. it, it, it's not subversive. It's not radical. It's not edgy. It, it, it is ascendant, and mm -hmm. well, that's what that, that's why they they realize deep down that. You know, this is a designator of sort of social status. I, I, you, you can see there's a sort of knowing relationship between the people on the camera and the camera itself. They're sort of looking at the, the way that they're laughing. They know that this is the officially approved position to hold. So even though it actually might be skin deep in some of their in, in some of their cases, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the chaps was was white himself. Does he really think that every single white person in his life has contributed nothing? Like, is he, is he, does he not mm -hmm. have? F f f f you know, father figures, uncle figures, other p people in his life who've made an immense contribution. It's a sort of um, it allows people to inhabit this sort of uh, false reality. That, that so, what do you mean by that? All these people are, d are doing, really, fundamentally, when you when you look at the facts on the ground, th they're, they're echoing the ruling ideology while posing as rebels outside of uh, of the city walls. Uh, and I think as well, I think th this is this is both grounds for encouragement and you know despair. I think. A lot of, the, given the, the way that they were sort of delivering these views that they have, the way that they were sharing these views about white men not having value, mm. that they weren't sort of d delivered with a sort of Goebbels-like stare. Like they, 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 they didn't, they didn't look like they had sort of genuine venom in their in, in their faces when they were right. saying. No, they it's were just a joke. Like I feel like a lot of them, it's 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 kind of soft. Uh, 
almost you know unconvincing like I think you know revealed preferences yeah. Harrison do you actually think any of these people you know if they were you know say unfortunately in a house fire and a white dude comes save them they'd be like oh great yeah. another white man <laughs> coming in and interjecting into my absolutely. space like, absolutely no of course exactly. not exactly at this point it's more of a matter of sort of moral exhibitionism yeah. than deep belief that's what I'm, that's, I suppose what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to hint at but, but what I'm worried about is the prospect that we get to a point where this ideology is so entrenched in our institutions mm -hmm. it, it just bec it, it becomes so all pervasive that it does become to be implanted in the human heart as well. And we start to believe it. And we start yeah. to believe yeah. it, that's why it's no, implanted, totally implanted right. in the human heart. Well, it's already getting implanted in the AI. It, it? It's, that's true. Yeah. You know, it's true. It's true. But, but this is the other thing that I, I would say as well, and th this is going to look like a sort of a threat. It definitely isn't. It's, <laughs> it's a warning. But, you know, history is replete with examples of majorities, whether ethnic or mm. tribal or whatever it might be, behaving in really grotesque fashion towards minorities, whether it's the Turks against the Armenians, whether it's the Serbians against Bosnians. I mean, history is replete with examples of this. Um, and I can't think of anything less wise than demonizing relentlessly an ethnic major majority, which in fact, by historical standards, which is, is extremely tolerant. Like mm -hmm. one, Britain is one of the most racially tolerant societies in human history. And so, but how long will it be so if the majority, the tolerant majority for the most part in that society mm. is relentlessly vilified. Yeah. That, that can't be a prudent thing to be doing. No, I agree. I completely mm. agree. Mm. 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 Yeah, you're not wrong. Well guys, thanks very much. Thank really you. informative. Looking forward to catching up next week to see how much crazier this has all got. And thank you very much for watching. That's all we've got time for. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And if you've got any comments about the discussion, leave them below. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.